Welcome to the 38th Real Business of Wine sessions and this one tonight is on Russia. We have been looking already, we've looked at India, we've looked at Brazil and of course we've had sessions on South Africa and New Zealand and the interesting thing about Russia like Brazil is that it's both a wine market and a producing country about which most people don't know very much. Um, I'm going to declare my own interest uh, right at the beginning, which is that I've been going to Russia for a very long time. And I personally didn't have any great belief in it as a wine market when I first went there, uh, even before the fall of the, uh, of the Iron Curtain in the late 80s. Um, and I've seen the market develop over that time. And my own Le Grand Noir wines have taken off extraordinarily well in, in Russia. Um, and that Russia is now our equal, it's either our second or first, depending on, on any given time, uh, market. So it's, it's a market that I'm fascinated by, but it isn't an easy market and it's not a straightforward market, which is why I'm so happy to be doing this um, session uh, today. And um, we have, we're very lucky as, as ever to have a very, top flight um, team of, of taste, of, sorry, of, of experts uh, talking to us and we'll actually be really covering as much as we can of the, of the market and what Russia really um, is about at the moment. So with no particular order, I'm going to give them to the people as you see them across the top of the, of the screen, and certainly the way I see them, Polly Hammond, my partner in crime on all of these who's got some connection problems this evening, so she may disappear from the screen um, sometimes. Sergei Panov, who's a journalist who uh, has a very clear idea of the Russian market and for whom, to whom I am very grateful for the chart you can see behind my head, which I've slightly amended to make it more readable. So it's, it's, it's uh, slightly more clumsy than it looks. We'll talk a little bit about that, but that chart shows what's happened to the Russian wine market over the last few months. Uh, Dmitry Mershko uh, is from Simple Wine News, and this is a complicated area in Russia because Russia kind of doesn't have wine magazines, but it does have certainly wine, Sim Simple Wine News is a, it's a catalog and a magazine, and it's produced by the company Simple, which is one of the biggest importers distributors, and it is the one that distributes uh, my wine in Russia. Vladimir Tsvakalik, who I've known for a very long time as well, um, is focused on the, the restaurant world in Russia, which I think is going to be a very important uh, part of our picture. Certainly the quality of food and uh, the quality of wine lists in Russia is phenomenal and getting better all the time. And I have judged at the Russian uh, sommelier of the year competition and the quality of sommeliers is, is um, very, very high with a lot of uh, competitiveness, I'd say, amongst the, the young sommeliers, but a lot of young, young female sommeliers in Russia and a lot of young women in the, Rus in the Russian wine business overall, which is not something that I would have expected when I was in Russia in the 1990s. And again, I'd be interested to hear from the panel about the influence of women on the Russian uh, wine market. And lastly, and certainly not least, uh, Anton Palancenko, who again comes from the, the restaurant world and, and as a sommelier, but also now as a consultant. So welcome, Anton. And uh, as I said, we'll, we'll talk about the whole of the, 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 the picture of Russia, but I'd like to kick off actually with Sergei. Um, a, just talk us through this little uh, chart behind my head, which gives us a very immediate picture of, of what's happening in Russia over the last few months. But could we also go back and describe um, the last, I mean, let's say the last five or 10 years, how the Russian wine market has evolved? Because it has one of the, 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 the I think the things we're going to be talking about is how Russia has been a very, very effective market for wine that hasn't always been focused on as much as say China and some of the other countries that you, you read about um, in the press in the rest of the world. So Sergei, looking at that chart and looking at the last 10 years, what's been happening in wine in Russia, both in volumes, prices, and where wine's been coming from? Okay, so 
Uh, if we speak about uh, COVID-19 influence uh, and uh, last maybe uh, 10 years, I would say that uh, there were great period before 2014 and uh, Crimea annexation and um, also a national ca uh, currency fall and Russia well, was an even bigger market than uh, uh, it was now because uh, ruble exchange rate falls almost uh, two times to, uh, during one year and of course it uh, influenced a lot on uh, wine in, uh, import market so it was uh, a great fo uh, fall where russia was uh, recovering during uh, uh, from 15 to 19 and last year uh, we saw a great uh, uh, increase and uh, 19 uh, import volumes were promising and we see growth for 21 percent in uh, steel wine import and for 16% uh, in sparkling wines and uh, sh uh, champagne. But unfortunately, then uh, COVID-19 uh, happened. Before that, uh, we were a, a bit strange market because uh, uh, comparing to other wine importing countries, uh, uh, we import a lot of Georgian wine and Georgia now became a second biggest uh, exporter of uh, wine to Russia. Italy is uh, number one and uh, number three is uh, Spain and uh, France is uh, fourth and they almost uh, dominate uh, the whole market counting for uh, all together for around 80 percent and uh, Georgia is uh, still gr uh, growing during recent years. So that's an interesting point to make which is that uh, talking about Georgia its importance today and because Georgia is very successful in some other markets including China and indeed certainly the US and elsewhere you and Georgia has a very long history of being successful in uh, in the Russian market even going back a long time because Stalin was from Georgia you had Georgian restaurants even when there weren't very many restaurants but you had a period when Georgian wine was removed from your market wasn't it yeah, it was. Uh, it took place uh, after Russian-Georgian uh, uh, war in uh, 2008 and uh, the ban uh, it finished in 2014 or uh, th uh, 15, around these years. And since that, we uh, saw a tremendous grow growth of uh, Georgian wines. Even instead, uh, we did not have a lot of, uh, let's say, Georgian wine seminar or any marketing activity. It is just, uh, uh, let's say, very uh, good emotional attitude towards uh, Georgian wine and Georgian uh, culture and uh, cuisine, which uh, we see in Russia. Uh, so uh, just to give you uh, a general picture about uh, what uh, wine uh, market in Russia is and where Russian drink wine and uh, so on, the average uh, bottle cost in Russia is uh, uh, around 350 rubles, uh, which means uh, around uh, 7 euro uh, per uh, today's uh, uh, value. But it means that uh, this wine costs around 2 euro uh, exports on the winery uh, be before the wine is uh, imported. And uh, in Russia, uh, consumption in on trade in uh, Horeca is uh, quite low comparing to Europe because uh, we drink around 91 92 percent in uh, we buy it in uh, retail in supermarket and uh, e-commerce is uh, officially uh, prohibited in general and uh, for on trade it's uh, accounting for eight to nine percent of uh, wine consumption now one of the things that uh, um, i'm gonna move across to dimitri in a second but one of the things that's also interesting to me is in terms of the old uh Eastern Bloc, let's say, um, if you go back to the 80s, um, 70s and 80s, countries like Bulgaria and Hungary, uh, Romania used to supply wine to Russia uh, at a very low price. And I, I think at one time it was one liter of wine for one liter of petrol or whatever the, the deal was. Um, what is the relationship now uh, between wines from those old neighboring countries, the, the Bulgarias, Romanias, Czech Republics, and so on, in terms of the Russian market. And Moldova obviously would fit into that as well. But as Except uh, Moldova, uh, there are not significant uh, 
and uh, even are not included in top 10 or top uh, 15 uh, wine importing co uh, countries at the moment. Uh, Moldova uh, is growing now. It has a good position in uh, retail and very good uh, price for quality ratio. For example, we could uh, see good wines such as uh, aged in uh, uh, oak uh, Moldovan Pinot Noir for very cheap uh, and almost uh, bargain prices. But all the Eastern Bloc uh, countries, I would say that uh, they are not significant at all as uh, uh, wine uh, exporters to Russia. And we should also say that Moldova went through its own period of being blocked from, from Russia as well, wasn't it? Um, which was another, another issue. Dimitri, can I move across to you looking at um, wearing both of your hats, if you like, because on one hat you're also journalistic in the same way as Sergei, but also you, you have an insight into what happens in wine distribution and through, through Simple. Um, can you say in terms of what kinds, we, we've heard already that it's certainly Italy being very strong, Georgia, Spain, France, surprisingly at number four rather than maybe number three or number two, and also the new world, um, you know, where is, uh, where is Australia, where is Chile, where is New Zealand in this list, and are they, are they coming up or are they locked out by the traditional um, countries? Well, I think it's pretty much um, uh, stable, and I think that um, it's, it's more than uh, um, it's more kind of matter of of, of um, uh, competition between the brands of the country uh, of the um, brand producers. Like um, the stronger the brand, the better the position. Of the, the new world countries, well, I, I think it's it's obvious and it's uh, it's quite typical. Um, I think still Chile is is popular and uh, uh, sold at very good price. Um, Australia is not that popular, maybe that it it might be spotted looking at the uh, British uh, shelves. Um, uh, although there are some. Um, but, uh, I would say for um, for countries like Australia, um, um, we have some um, very basic wines from um, Riverina Riverland. I mean, from from this this part of Australia uh, that might be bottled in Europe, for example, and uh, sold at quite low price. Uh, on, the, on, on the other hand, we may have um, the top brands like Hardy's, like, like Anfold's. Um, what um, is uh, maybe hard to, uh, to expect here is the, 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 middle, uh, uh, the middle range wines of smaller producers. So they uh, so of course uh, there are producers like Two Hands, which are relatively small, but in general, it's big brands either on their low end or on their top uh, or on the top end. But there is no something in between. The I mean, uh, it's a little bit I would say um, for Chile and for Australia a little bit archetypal. So we, we have uh, big brands, um, Chilean Cabernet, Chilean Merlot, top quality Chilean Cabernets, one or two positions of Paris or old wine Sanso, which is not very typical for Chile, uh, one or two positions of interesting Grenache uh, from Australia. Like for example, it, it's, uh, in, uh, it's impossible, almost impossible, to find the uh, Hunt Valley Simeon in Russia. I mean, it's just it's not easy in Lo it's, it's not easy in London either. And yeah, people yeah, yeah. find it, <laughs> yeah. bottles are actually very often stuck to the shelves because people right. don't necessarily buy them. <laughs> well, so uh, um, I think uh, those two markets are pretty much stable. But I mean, very uh, again, I would say very 
archetypal. So, I mean, what to expect you get, you, you're getting. So uh, that, that, that raises one other question, and I'll come back to some other things, but Russian wine, um, <laughs> which nobody talked about, again, 20, 30 years ago, um, from Krasnodar, uh, particularly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, obviously, the, the one that maybe some people have heard about would be Russian sparkling wine from particularly Abradorsu um, as a big brand. And a lot of people knew of, of Russian quote unquote champagne, even mm -hmm. under the old, uh, the old days. W what is happening within the Russian category within, in, uh, in the Russian market? How, how popular are those wines becoming? It's flourishing. Um, I mean, uh, eight years ago, uh, I, mean, I mean, almost eight, eight years ago, in fall of 2012, we um, and our colleagues like Artur Sarkisian, we got together and the, for the first time we had serious tasting of new wave of Russian wines. But at that time, it was even hard to, um, to get journalists from um, um, which is outside of, of the wine industry, treated seriously. Uh, but uh, just uh, yesterday, we published uh, a story on our website about new releases of Russian wineries. So it's uh, like only this spring, it's 50 new releases from 16 companies. And maybe it may be more, but this is what we, we know at the moment. And it's uh, it, it's uh, our top story. So now it's, I think from outside, if you asked anybody who knew anything about it, they might imagine that there was a lot of Saparavi uh, in there, and maybe uh, Regazzatelli and some of the older varieties that you see in Georgia and elsewhere. But from what I've seen, um, A, there's a lot of Cabernet, there's Merlot, there's other, um, there's some Italian grapes that I've seen being grown. And you have another variety called Krasnostop, Yes, uh, which is one that uh, I don't think is grown very much anywhere outside Russia, to the best of my knowledge. Um, and in whites, again, there's, there's quite a broad variety of styles. Could you talk a little bit about that for a second? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, this is always was my question to, to, to winemakers. And, and uh, when we were talking about this in the, in the like, um, in, in wine community, what is Russian wine? Because we've got this um, um, archetypal styles in New World, like I just mentioned. In Chile, we have uh, top quality Cabernets. In Australia, we have Shirazes. Of course, there are some uh, variety of styles and, um, and variety of varieties. But we have something that um, actually um, drives the, the, the whole industry. Like uh, New Zealand has its Sauvignon Blanc, which is uh, um, the main major driver of the, of the country to the international market, but at the same time, because of the, uh, of the production, because um, everyone, uh, I mean, uh, most of wine lovers uh, connect, um, inevitably connect uh, uh, New Zealand with Sauvignon Blanc, although I'm much more interested in uh, varieties and uh, interesting releases. We don't have this in Russia because what is Russian wine? Krasna stop? It's well, some uh, wineries produces uh, produces some 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 don't. Is it uh, should it be monovarietal or should it go with other uh, in blend with Bordeaux varieties? We don't know. There are good ex uh, examples of uh, one approach and of other approach. Uh, what uh, we noticed uh, in this trend that we, uh, I mean, in, the, in this uh, bunch of releases that we just uh, saw, um, less uh, wineries, I mean, I mean, less new wines produced out, out of Cabernet and Merlot. More produced from Pinot Noir and from rare varieties we can call them autochthonous or, or indigenous varieties. We can call them um, hybrids. Uh, we can call uh, them vinifera hybrids because um, uh, 
there are some um, uh, varieties that are basically not real hybrids with, with American wines, but hybrids with Asian uh, and I mean uh, descendants in a couple of generations from them. But uh, um, people work with, with those varieties and well, of course, with uh, um, these approaches of selecting good um, plot of land, controlling the, uh, the, the yield, they get um, interesting results. Um, uh, they, they also, uh, on, on a second, they also experiment with, with vine making techniques. So, uh, for example, one, uh, one a uh, winery um, um, released um, a couple of wines made with a passamento technique. Um, and um, the range of varieties is quite wide. So Rome varieties, uh, Syrah, uh, Grenache, uh, not, not Grenache, uh, Grenache, not this, uh, Marcelan. Um, so um, I'll say that it's getting more diverse and although we don't have this uh, um, key, uh, key driver of the whole uh, industry as a, like, our workhorse variety, um, uh, it's, I mean, it's not a problem at the moment because this diversity let you, uh, us to get good results. Thank you very much. I'm going to move across. Let's look at the restaurant um, world, not just the restaurant world, but it, but obviously that's a, a very important uh, way of getting wine known. Um, Vladimir, and, and you've done a lot of wine judging around around the world as well. What's I mean, obviously in the last few months, the restaurant business is is, is in a different state. But uh, if we go back to 2019, when everything was was going quite well, um, what was selling in restaurants what was what was exciting the the sommeliers Vladimir. Uh, robert you know uh i'm not a restaurant guy in full sense no. so I have, you, you have a vision you have yeah, a vision yeah, just of just vision from outside of the restaurant mm -hmm. and uh, i i have a club which is the oldest in russia it was like education tasting club and this year in june i i would like to make celebration 20 years however uh, it's not possible to make it in june all restaurants are closed and uh, the future for restaurants and uh, other ventures which selling wines are not clear uh, thinking about last year and uh, several previous years we had very nice development of wine bars and it was a completely new uh, new development for russia so they were getting more and more popular more and more wines and uh, not mass wines but very special uh, wines from small producers were sold and uh, I felt like it will be really, really future for our wine uh, restaurant business. Now, I do not believe that many of wine bars will be alive after several months, which they didn't work. And uh, we need to think something about, about internet trade which is getting more and more powerful because of this coronavirus. So maybe some guys who owned wine bars in Moscow, St. Petersburg, Yekaterinburg, Rostov and Don, they will move completely to internet. The problem with internet that it's not officially allowed to sell wine via internet in Russia. However, internet is widely used for these purposes, uh, but not officially. So I think that the future of 
our restaurants not very clear but more and more uh, things will be done in internet so what i'm what my understanding in russia is that whereas in some other markets i can just go on well, many other markets i can go online place an order the wine arrives in russia i go and look at a website i can find something but then i still have to go to the store effectively no 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 uh, I don't know if it's uh, completely unofficial, but now I can call to the company and I can order wines and they will bring me to my home. But that's new, isn't it? That, that, that wasn't happened last year. I never did it before, you know, I do it now. And I don't know uh, if it's really official. Maybe guys- And there's another point that- so Joseph uh, Timkovsky asked the question about the share of wine e-commerce in Russia, and I'm sure we can't give that share because it's, it's unofficial. But Joseph asked another question, which is what is the share of Russian wine sales from Moscow and St. Petersburg? And I think that's a very interesting question because in my uh, visits to Russia, I've been very interested to see the growth of wine in other cities outside uh, those two famous hubs. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Right, wine in, wine in, where, where is wine sold most successfully in the cities in Russia? Other people may have an idea, Dimitri, you may have an idea as well, Sergei, but, but Vladimir, what do you think? I can give my idea, but the guys uh, can do other answers. So my thinking is that Moscow is almost half of sales and it's the most important city for wine. Second is St. Petersburg. The third is Yekaterinburg and uh, Rostov maybe. Krasnodar is quite important. Uh, Volgograd, but I don't know if it's true, but I feel like uh, about 50% of wine are sold, wines are sold in Moscow. Is it correct, guys? Uh, Dimitri, um, oh, I'll just unmute you so you can say this. Do you have a vision of Dimitri or, mm. or indeed Sergei? Yep. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I'd agree with Vladimir um, just a couple of years ago um, because definitely I would say like maybe five, six years ago, it was really true. Eighty percent of the market was Moscow and Pit. I think now gradually it's changing. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell you the the figures at the moment. Just I mean, don't have the uh, in my hands, but steadily growing. Um, and uh, you can see it. Uh, well, uh, one small example. Uh, it's interesting, the, the most successful specialized retailer comes from the region, uh, comes from Euros. It's called uh, Krasne Bele, red and white. And uh, started, of, co of course, I mean, uh, of course, it, it's quite a hard region to start with wine. So they started with um, wine and other alcoholic drinks uh, and spirits first. But, um, I mean, we may see how uh, they are evolving uh, in terms of their wine shelf and a couple of uh, recent findings that the wine community is discussing is very interesting uh, samples uh, they have on their shelves. And Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, Anton. I'm sorry to um, your last but not least in this in this group. Um, one of the things that has excited me in my uh, times when I've been visiting Russia, and I was there uh, early when about roughly this time last year, in fact, um, is the what it seems to be the explosion of interest in wine amongst younger Russians. And that may be relevant to what uh, Vladimir was talking about in terms of the success of wine bars. Um, are you, have you been noticing that over the last few years? 
Um, I have to say yeah. that uh, as I come from a little bit older generation than youngsters, uh, I do my best uh, to uh, to get my kids used to wine instead of beer or something else. But nowadays they are 14, they didn't drink nothing. They say we don't want that at the moment. But I was extremely happy when uh, one friend of mine who is a restaurant critic, uh, he took me to a wine bar, which is called Navina, which, uh, which uh, you can in, uh, interpret like uh, get your wine. And it was really packed uh, with, young, with, with youngsters. I, I felt almost like a dinosaur there. And uh, most of the people there were between 20 and 30. And uh, it really made me happy to see that uh, these young people, they prefer wine, not beer, not hard liquor or something else. Because when I was uh, in their age, we all drank cocktails and tequila. And uh, I was really happy to see that uh, wine culture is uh, um, well accepted by youngsters. And uh, I have That's a little... Tom, because... Yeah. Go on. Yeah, just a small remark on, on uh, New World Wines uh, in restaurant segment. Uh, I, I made me a note. I was really surprised. I, I work as a wine director for a big restaurant group. And uh, one of our restaurants, uh, it has like 800 wines uh, on the wine list. And 6% uh, by volume, what is sold, is New Zealand uh, Sauvignon Blanc there. And another restaurant, which is in the top 20, it is like uh, five percent of uh, uh, more than one thousand labels on the wine list, and uh, five percent of the wine which is uh, so, uh, sold sold by volume is New Zealand uh, Sauvignon Blanc. So it's uh, new Pinot Grigio now in, in in Moscow, at least. So that's so, so one of the things to... that struck me. Thank you for that, and uh, I'm sure Polly, who lives in although she's American by by birth, lives in uh, Auckland, New Zealand. So. I think particularly pleased to, to hear that. But uh, one of the things that struck me last year um, was uh, at, a, at, a, at a big event was the respect that uh, the not just young people, particularly young people, were paying towards wine. Now, I think as any outside, and I have a number of Russian friends within Russia and, and, uh, and outside who um, would traditionally say that if there's a bottle of vodka or some bottles of wine and you have some Russian friends, you end up with some pretty empty bottles by the end of the evening um, on, on a lot of occasions. And here I was at a, an event where there were uh, a lot of wine stands, a lot of people pouring wine and people being very respectful to say, no, don't pour me too much. They wanted to taste a lot of wines. They were spitting. And it seems to me that, that there's a, uh, not just an interest in wine, but a respect for wine that maybe I wouldn't have seen 10 years ago. Is, is that is that just me being fanciful or is that something that you would, you would say? I, I, I connect that uh, with the prohibition of uh, advertisement of hard liquor and uh, beer on the TV and in mass media. That That's first of all. And second, I think now finally the wine has image of the drink of uh, successful and uh, f fashionable people. So if you are successful you drink wine you don't drink uh, vodka or something like that and that's very good uh, for the image of wine and for wine culture i think so how is because you know our, our, our title is what the real business of wine how is wine promoted in russia because there are limits on advertising there's limits on all sorts of, of promotion how do wines become known in Russia. I'll, I'll continue with you for a moment, Anton, and I'll come back to Sergei as a journalist in a second. But Anton, yeah, what uh, do you think? Uh, are, are my, my, from my point of view, what I see, uh, it is done mostly in uh, social networks, and uh, it, is, it is promoted uh, as a part of lifestyle. That's how I see it, from my point of view. So if somebody, if, if you did have an Australian wine company or, or, or indeed a New Zealander and they wanted to sell their wine in Russia, first you need a distributor and the, do you have a national or a local distributor? And then Lots secondly, of... how would you get into those sort of networks? It Any depends ideas? on your distributor's activity and uh, you have to have a really good and reliable partner who will be active promoting your wine, and that's the key to success, I think. 
Okay, so that's not that different to us. But Sergey, um, looking at it, if you like independently, how do you see, because I, I, private labels uh, are incredibly successful in Germany and indeed in, in the UK and other markets. Are they as strong in Russia as they are at other markets? Retailer labels? Sorry, I need to... Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Oh, very, very nice. So regarding uh, private labels of uh, importer, it is a growing trend. And uh, thank you for uh, noting this, because uh, in correlation to the uh, in comparison with the previous year, uh, private imports of uh, importers rose uh, up to 35% of uh, total wine import. And just a year ago, it was uh, um, less than 30. So uh, during uh, last financial crisis and uh, uh, during pr uh, the pressure of uh, uh, currency uh, rate, retailers are pushing their price and they are trying to exclude importer from uh, supply chain in order to get uh, more att attractive prices. And I think that uh, this trend would uh, continue with the COVID and it would even get uh, stronger in mass market segment, I mean. And, in, okay. and for a premium se segment for fine wine uh, pr producers, I think that uh, the most important thing is uh, uh, to work with uh, importer and to uh, talk with the uh, sommelier, get workshops, get regular tastings and thinking of maybe uh, how they do uh, their work. I just give you an example because, uh, uh, as uh, I told be before uh, in a conversation with uh, Felicity Car uh, Carter, that uh, in recent, uh, recently opened wine bars in Moscow, you could uh, much more easily find some selection of uh, Spät Burgunders from Germany than classic Burgundy Pinot Noirs, because uh, it was a great job of uh, Vinotera, wine trading company. Uh, and its uh, CEO and also of uh, Wine of Germany, our uh, marketing board that uh, repositioned Spät Burgunders as an uh, alternative to Bur uh, Burgundy. And they do uh, their work very well in uh, some of the SR uh, circles. So in Moscow and in St. Petersburg, it is uh, one of uh, the trends. And how many big, how, how many importers and distributors are that, so assuming a, a new young or well, winery that isn't in Russia, wants to sell wine in Russia, um, how, how many doors can they knock on to, to actually uh, get their wine into the market? And, and should they be looking regionally? Uh, we've been already hearing that a lot of the market is still in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Is there much point in trying to find somebody in, a lo in another region um, separate to those cities? My first advice would be to, uh, to find a retail buyer uh, who uh, could buy their wine. And I think it would be a more uh, efficient way uh, for uh, entering the Russian market. And for uh, fine wine, there are around uh, 60 to 70 uh, wine importers. But uh, I would say that maybe 10 companies have uh, good, uh, good knowledge uh, of uh, wine market and good uh, connections with uh, Samalia. And, um, uh, there are pro uh, professionals who could sell wine in uh, restaurants. And regarding original importers, there are companies in uh, St. Petersburg also, but in other regions, you, it's uh, hard to find any um, uh, importers. Uh, Dimitri is raising his hand. Uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, you can find um, 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 regionally based um, um, specialist retailers, retail chains. Uh, one I mentioned is Krasny Bele from Klebinsk, it's in Urals. Uh, I would mention another one, which is quite, I would, I would, it's steadily growing, but not that, uh, they're not boosted, but I mean, quite steady growing uh, retail chain from Nizhny Novgorod. Uh, and there, there is another um, uh, remarkable import, uh, importer from Nizhny Novgorod, actually, 
who drowned Russian market uh, uh, in uh, in uh, alcoholic lemonade, uh, lemonade called vodka. Yeah, but they also have in, in, uh, um, um, fine wine hand. So, so I think there is uh, there are importers, there are retailers and retail chains outside Moscow and Saint Petersburg. Although when they develop in their regions, the next point is Moscow. And if I, you open the door there talking about um, yeah. other sorts of beverages, what about uh, moving out of the 75 cent a litre bottle of wine? How about cans of wine, bag in box, other formats? Because for example, uh, simple within the simple um, companies, you have a wine bar, you did have a wine bar, the, the steak bars with draft wine where people could actually pull, I don't know if that's still happening, but people could fill their own glass of yes. wine mm -hmm. from a tap. Um, is that kind of innovation happening or is that uh, slow? I think slowly, but it is, is going to happen. And I think quite soon, just right before the, the, the lockdown, I had a meeting with uh, guys who are promoting their wine technology uh, and they have production somewhere in, in south of, oh no, they produce the, the, the um, plastic cakes in Germany, but they, they, they then um, import them to Russia. And actually it's, it, we're counting um, um, how much it, uh, it costs to um, wine into cake and then sell it on tap. And it, it, it's quite, I mean, it's quite reasonable to do, to, to do this. I think that Russian producers may start experimenting with this. About, what about cans? About cans? Um, well, not a lot, uh, but uh, there are one or two brands that uh, appear in uh, quite, I mean, um, um, mid-level or high-level retail chains uh, and retailers say they they sold, sold quite, uh, quite successfully. And well, actually, yeah, um, I think, yeah, I think it's even more. It's not a big share, but it's growing. And uh, the, the, the last thing about about uh, uh, Tetra Pak and Bag and Box, I believe it has great potential. I think the Thank image, I think the image is quite damaged by producers from Russia and from like neighbor countries like Bulgaria, who shipped not very. Um, um, uh, not very good wines in in nineties and early two uh, thousands in, in this format. So, mm. yeah, but that's changing now. Thank you very much, Anton. Yeah. Going yeah. back to your restaurants and the the, the eight hundred one thousand wines on the list, and and indeed the wine bars. Assuming that we get some of those wine bars back, the obvious question is how much is moving into organic, biodynamic, and of course, the, the natural wine sector. Is that, if I'm in New York or in Tokyo, certainly there's a boom in those kinds of products. What, what's happening in Russia? Yeah, 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 sure. We, of course, have, an, uh, have a very active uh, company, which, is, uh, which, which has found his niche in this and uh, very actively promoting it, especially for youngsters. And uh, I think that uh, in London, it's probably too. Uh, all these uh, low intervention wines are mostly consumed by younger people than uh, from our generation. And uh, yes, we have a real fashion for, the, for that kind of wines and uh, even big companies like Simple or Vinatera they also have a good part of portfolio of that kind of wines. And pet nuts are extremely popular with uh, youngsters uh, also. So yes, yes, we do this fashion. Uh, we do have this fashion, but uh, I think uh, it's 
really a fashion and uh, late after a few years it will become a niche product and uh, new fashion will come that's what i think okay what about the in terms of certainly in within russian wines but also in terms of imports what about sustainable and organic which are more long-term uh, concepts are you seeing a, a growing interest in those uh, in those categories um yes it it it, it it became popular quite long time ago and uh, if we are talking about russian producers we will, i think we still only have one pavel Schwerz, who produces his wines by that uh, methods um, not many others I, I don't know anybody other actually i would say and uh, so that's, that's, that's more about marketing i think and many people believe that interesting uh, and going back to, to you, Sergey, in terms of the, I've lost Vladimir's picture for a minute. I, I think he's still with us, but I'm just, um, I, I can't see him. Um, Sergey, looking at the, the future, obviously the, the future isn't very clear for any of us in, in any way at all. But if you had to look at 2021, 2022, assuming we do come out of this in, in some sort of state, um, do you think that, for example, the strength of Italian wine that we've seen so far, is that going to still be the, if the next five years, will Italy still be the, the big strength? Will Georgia still be the big strength? Or do you see, uh, for example, the, the, the uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs that Anton was talking about, do you see other styles uh, coming in? And that also raises a question while we're looking at it, as the, the in, there was a history in, in Russia of um, big, strong reds and also sweetness. I think sweetness in, in red wine was, was a tradition. Um, is that something you see changing? So regarding sweet or dry style, I would say that yeah. Russian are uh, drinking much more uh, drier wines. Uh, it could be compared by uh, the import of, uh, let's, let's say, Asti and uh, Prosecco, and now Prosecco is uh, in favor, and uh, import of uh, semi-sweet uh, and uh, sweet uh, sparkling wine uh, fell, I think, uh, around for 50% uh, during a recent t uh, 10 years. Uh, and this is uh, number one. And regarding countries, I wouldn't say uh, any particular country, but uh, for, for example, I would say that uh, the work that uh, Wines of Germany, for example, uh, made in promoting their wine in some of the uh, circles. It is uh, now, now seen. And uh, so I could not 100% say about retail, but uh, regarding uh, restaurants, it is uh, you know, also depending on marketing board, uh, board's activity. And uh, for this moment, we see almost uh, nothing except Germans, except uh, some uh, Austrian activities and also wines of uh, uh, California and uh, all the marketing board are almost not pre uh, pre present. Thank you. Um, Vladimir, you travel a lot outside Russia. Um, do you see Russian producers wanting to export their wines and do you think there's a potential for Russian wine to find its way onto uh, the shelves or the restaurant tables in, in other cities around the world? I know just few examples when Russian wines are presented in restaurants in European big cities. Uh, some wines are presented in French restaurants, some wines in German restaurants. I know only one German importer for Russian wine However, some companies, maybe one, maybe two, uh, they sell not via this importer, but directly to German market. Uh, Robert, you know that some wines of Abrao Durso are in England, yes? Mm -hmm. But it's just hundreds of bottles. It's like nothing. Uh, more visible, visible is uh, export to China. It, it's maybe thousands, thousands uh, 
bottles of wine from Kuban, Vino and Fanagaria. But for such a huge country, it's also nothing. So I would say that Russian companies are not very interested in exporting wines. They take part in many uh, international wine competitions and they have a lot of medals, but it's only for Russian market. If you have medals from international competitions, you show that you are a big guy and uh, your wine is uh, nice also for European markets. So I don't think that in nearest future we uh, need to export wines. We have only one fourth of our market, market uh, provided by Russian wine producers. So we need to import wine, not to export. And you know that to export wine means a lot of expenses. So it doesn't make sense to export wines for Russia. So that's interesting. And there's a note of, we were talking in the, in the chat, and I think it's worth, certainly when people are watching this on, on the video, it's worth saying the discussion about sweet and dry because the, that certainly was a tradition of sweet red wine in, in Russia. I've seen the, the switch to dry wine, certainly and dry red wine, particularly amongst younger consumers. Um, Anton, you were saying that uh, in the premium sector segment, there isn't really as much of a market for those sweet wines as there was in the past. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, because uh, because uh, in the Soviet time, uh, most of the wines uh, sold uh, to publics, they were sweet or Swedish. And it was easy to hide uh, the defects of, of the wine behind sugar. And uh, it was more important, the quantity than the quality of wine. So the wine must be available and uh, uh, in quantities and in price for white public. So, uh, nowadays, people of older generation, they associate sweeter wines with uh, cheap quality and uh, they don't like that. And uh, in premium segment, it's really not popular to drink uh, something sweet. And champagne, demi sec, it's very, very low. I mean, if you are talking about champagne. If you are talking about cheap wines for people who can afford wines up to 500 rubles, let's say uh, uh, below 10 euro per bottle. Sometimes they pre prefer even to five uh, to buy wines for five euro per bottle. Of course, uh, sweet is very popular. Thank you. I've got a question from Joseph Tinkovsky who asked uh, one of those questions earlier. Which distributors, retailers in Russia perform technology innovations for consumers? like developing apps, personalizing wine offerings. It's really the, who are the most cutting edge? Um, Dimitri, you might want to put your hand up for simple, I don't know, but who, who is, who's doing that? Actually, I'm going to throw that ball to you, Sergei, because you're as an independent uh, person looking at it. Is, it. is it happening? It's a good question. I would say that uh, applications, uh, you know, also it was made by simple where you can find uh, you know, wines imported by simple, it's uh, location, it's uh, availability, but uh, it wasn't that po uh, popular, despite that uh, the uh, application was uh, uh, fine. But I would say that uh, innovation and, and technology would come in wine business in uh, one or two years, because there are internet giants that enter in uh, wine market and also e-commerce. Like, for example, uh, the two biggest uh, Russian uh, internet companies, uh, Yandex, which is the uh, fifth uh, biggest uh, internet engine after Google and Yahoo and, uh, and so on, and which dominates the uh, Russian ma uh, market. It has uh, its own marketplace, and it has uh, also alcohol uh, store in its marketplace. Uh, at the moment, it works just uh, as online platform where you could check uh, wine availability and its price and its uh, description in some shops. Uh, but uh, after e-commerce uh, uh, would be allowed, they would gain a huge market share. And also, um, just for example, uh, now I know the internet giant, uh, Mailer Group, which has uh, its uh, 
uh, social networks, uh, also biggest uh, social networks in uh, Russia. And it has a lot of uh, data about uh, clients. Uh, it's uh, geotargeting, uh, it's uh, their dates uh, and uh, so on. And for example, they could track uh, visitors of a certain shop, uh, then uh, uh, target uh, 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 some promo campaign uh, to them and also send SMS with a discount offer to those who view this ad and also check uh, those who uh, made purchase in the shop and also made retargeting uh, campaign on those who view the ad but uh, didn't make a uh, purchase. And I think that these big guys uh, who has a lot of uh, data, let's say Russian Facebook, Russian uh, Google, they would be big players in uh, one, two or three years, it depends on uh, how fast you or low regarding e-commerce uh, would be adopted. And, and in terms of uh, why people buy wine, um, do, is Vivino, uh, does it have a following and what critics or social media or influencers are driving sales uh, in Russia, if any? Sergey? I would say that, uh, yeah, I would say that uh, the uh, in mass market, of course, it's uh, four basic pieces of uh, marketing, uh, price, prom uh, promo, and uh, so on. And it is uh, uh, merchandising techniques that could be used. For example, uh, if we need to promote some new position, uh, we would place it uh, very next uh, to the uh, its uh, competitor. Like, for example, if uh, one... Uh, producer, let's say from Tuscany, would like to build its uh, um, a new brand and I would like, uh, would like it to be purchased, just put it the next to Villa Antinori or Fresca Bali, which are uh, very well known. So it, it, it is uh, a case of uh, mass market. And uh, let's say for uh, fine wine, as uh, Anton mentioned earlier, there are opinion leaders uh, that, um, whose opinion mat matters. So for Thank one exit. Oh. So Dimitri, going back to you, it's simple. What do you see apart from the, you do tastings in your magazine, which I'm sure are influential. What do you see as being the most influential uh, ways of selling wine in, in Russia? Um, <clears throat> well, it's everywhere in, in the world. Um, there are, there's a complex of factors. Um, um, brand, I would say, which in in wine world uh, world is a uh, is a composition of the uh, producer, country, region, uh, variety, technique, for example. For example, uh, uh, just coming back to the uh, the new releases, um, uh, one. The wine that is, is released this spring is a Pernac uh, from uh, uh, a winery from Krasnodar, right? And actually, the, did you say Avranac? Uh, sorry, did you say Avranac? I didn't catch what it was. It was you saying what? Petnat. Pet Petnat. Pet yes, yeah, sorry. Yes. Pet Petnat. Yeah. And this is the selling thing. So I mean, uh, this is. Uh, Mid price segment, so the producers believe that it, it, it will work. I mean, they believe that this fashionable category will sell their wine. So, um, and it, it's really hard to, to uh, identify one factor. Well, uh, Robert, we've been discussing this with you a couple of times with your system in a uh, grape-based uh, uh, alcoholic uh, drink it's, it's one thing so it's uh, as well you think it's it's brand uh, the, uh, the, the, the awareness of humor about the variety and so on if we go to the uh, uh, other categories there will be other factors like for example uh, the 19 crimes that you uh, 
people know that the Australian wine is without any GI is a good seller in, in the stores because people just like play with augmented reality and stuff like that. So, I mean, everything that, that works everywhere in the world. Branding, Thank you very much for that. And in, in, in the, for, for each category, different types of branding. Thank you. We are six minutes over on overtime. We started a few minutes late, but um, I'm really grateful to all of you. It's, uh, it's I think, nine o'clock at night um, in, in Moscow, certainly. Um, and I think we've had a very good overall picture. The Russian market is a very complicated one. We haven't really talked about some of the complexities of back labels and official stickers and all sorts of things that have been um, issues in the past and suddenly government deciding that you need a new sticker and, and the price that you have to pay for some of these things. So th there are definitely uh, hurdles to get over in the market that may not be the same uh, as in other markets. On the other hand, you don't have a three tier system as you have in America. Right. <laughs> um, and you can, if you can get your wine into Moscow, you could get it into Rostov and you can get it into other cities Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of things. Uh, I would certainly, um, all I know is when I'm talking to producers, one of the reasons I was so happy to do this evening, when I'm talking to producers around the world about which country is working, and so often they say, oh yes, and the Russian market is, and they're talking about 2019, obviously. Um, but oh, it's the Russian market, that's a very nice one for us. And so obviously, and I can say the same. So thank you all very much for your time. Uh, subscribe, follow us. Thank you all for your time tonight and stay safe. Thank you very much. You too. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.